Welcome, listeners. Thanks for joining us, and welcome back to Dark and Disturbed Tales. I am your host, Steve Taylor. Tonight, we rejoin our protagonist as he walks the line between science and nightmares. As artificial intelligence is integrated into our lives, we have to ask, does life imitate art or does art imitate life? We join our protagonist as he runs in fear for his life. Parts of this story contain some violent content and may be disturbing to some viewers. Listener discretion is advised. Now, I present to you The Replacements, The Day They Took Over, Part 2. Written by Leon Hamilton and Nightwatcher 666. Narrated by Beatles Fan Eyes. With special guest stars, The Ghost of 94, Duchess of Darkness, and Creepy Face. <laughs> the sound of footsteps echoed around me as the horde of mindless drones closed in. Making a right on the next street, I was met by more of them standing in the road. Shit! <sighs> Changing course, I made a hard left, cutting across the street before sprinting through the parking lot of a small convenience store. A quick glance through the window told me I wouldn't be safe inside. The cashier was one of them. As I rounded the corner of the building, one of the drones called out. Contain him. Stop the human. I was running on fumes as I cut through the alley. My heart was racing. My muscles were burning and I felt like I was going to puke. I didn't know what they would do if they caught me, but I didn't want to find out. Running like a madman, I started knocking over trash cans, hoping they'd slow the drones down. But it didn't work. They b- <laughs> they barely missed a step. As a matter of fact, they seemed to be a bit closer now. When I made it, when I made it to the next street, it took everything in me to keep going. There was a gray Sprinter van parked in the road ahead of me. Well, if one if one of the doors was unlocked, I might be able to get in. But I I didn't have the time to check as I race past it. I could have sworn I saw someone duck down. Pushing myself a little harder, I tried to keep my eyes on the road in front of me. There was nowhere to go. The drones would be on me any second, and I was slowing down. Every muscle in my body felt like it was on fire. I had to stop. There was, there was just enough time to take a deep breath and looked back before the first drone slammed into me. Oh, God, the impact sent me tumbling backwards. And I was instantly engulfed by the crowd. All I could see were expressionless faces staring down at me as they grabbed my arms and legs. This was it. I was about to die or get turned into one of those fucking things. And there was nothing I could do about it. No matter what happened, I I wasn't going to make it easy for them. I fought and I did my best to break free. But in their iron grips, in the end, there were just way too many. Once they had me on the ground, the horde stopped. Then in unison said... Anomaly contained. Proceed to processing.
The four drones that were holding me down lifted me into the air and began walking. As they carried me through the crowd, the sound of a horn and a roaring engine filled the air. Still squirming and attempting to break free, I glanced up the road and saw headlights speeding towards the horde. It was the sprinter van, before any of the drones could react. Racing the engine and horn blaring, it plowed through a large section of the crowd. Bodies sailed through the air, or got rolled over as the speeding behemoth cleared a path. What was left in its wake was a twisted mass of twitching bodies flopping around on the pavement. They sizzled and popped, releasing sparks as the van hooked a 180 in the intersection and came back. The first pass took a good seven or eight with them, but the second one did some damage. There were only eight of them left now. The four that were carrying me and in the handful that hadn't been run over. When the van finally came to a stop, the cargo door slid open, and out jumped a tall, skinny guy with a ZZ top beard, and he yelled, Woohoo! Come on, you sons of bitches! Get you some! Clutching a crowbar in his hand, he leapt out of the van and immediately started bashing in the heads. It was brutal and fast. The first one of those things to attack him was an old lady in a nightgown. When she lunged at him, he stepped back and brought that crowbar down on top of its head. There was a loud crack from the impact, followed by a high-pitched whine as if the old bat... <sighs> As the old bat dropped to her knees, I didn't get a good look at the second attacker because the drones were carrying me away from the fight. When they got further away, they picked up their pace up to a jog. We'd cleared a block in no time, but as they turned onto the next street, the van came speeding past us, slamming on the brakes and positioning the van to block the road. The driver hopped out, crowbar in hand, and he rushed the drones. Then something strange happened. They, they didn't fight back. It was like they couldn't stop doing what they were doing or programmed to do. They didn't even try to defend themselves. I watched and Exhausted disbelief as this stranger drove the long end of his pry bar through, the, through their skulls and set me free. I must have been in shock or something because the next few minutes were a blur. I, I slightly remember him rushing to me, the van but it was all a carousel blur. I, I didn't snap out of it till he lit a cigarette, exhaled his first drag, and he looked at me and asked, What's your name? Still slightly in a daze and confused, I, I absolutely said, Tim? All right, Tim. I'm Philip. My friends call me Philly, and if you don't mind me asking, just what in the hell were you doing back there? I... I don't know how to answer the question. Uh, the last few hours had, had my mind so twisted and fucked up, I couldn't find the right words. When I... when I didn't respond right away... <laughs> you probably as messed up as I was a few days ago. Take your time, it'll come to you. <laughs> Oddly enough, he was right. After a few seconds, it came to me. 
I was trying to get to my home, but those fucking things stopped me. After what happened to Jay, I couldn't let them catch me. Okay, see? I told you he'd pop up. So, who's Jay and why were you going home? <laughs> I told him about Jay's grandmother and in the lab and in her basement. And But when I told him about Jay attacking me, he cut me off. Why'd you go downstairs? It was your buddy's granny. Why didn't he go down there? And how'd they swap him out so quickly? Not for nothing, but I'm pretty sure your buddy set you up. Think about it. He had to be one of them, unless there was another him already in the house. I ain't meant to cut you off, but I had to point that out. Go ahead, finish saying what you were saying. I looked at him for a long second, then shook my head. He was right again. I hadn't, I hadn't had time to think it over. The realization that my best friend had been replaced and I hadn't noticed blew my mind trying not to get lost in my thoughts. I finished telling him everything and when I got to the part about my gun collection, he pulled off of the road and stopped the van. Turning to face me, Phil blinked rapidly a few times while cupping his hand behind his ear, pretending it made him hear better. Um, I ain't sure I heard you correctly. You mind repeating that? I took a breath and I said, I've got a decent gun collection and enough ammo to ride this out. I was going home to barricade myself in and use every last round to keep those fucking things away from me. Pressing his hands together as if he were praying, Phil tilted his head back so he was looking up at the sky. Ask and you shall receive. Praise the Lord and pass the ammunition. First off, you should have left with that. We could have gotten to the rest later. Second, that's the stupidest fucking thing I've ever heard. It's only in every apocalypse movie ever. There's always some dumbass that holds up with a shitload of guns and then dies hot. Don't be that guy, Tim. We should go get them guns and get busy while we still can. I was already starting to get irritated with this guy. We? There's no we. I'm still trying to figure out what the fuck is going on. You've got no idea how much shit I've been through in the last few hours. I've been set up, ambushed, and nearly fucking killed. I feel like I'm losing my fucking mind. <laughs> son. Look here, let me tell you something. Three days ago, I was driving a truck, minding my own business. Then I came here. Since then, I've been attacked by a nutsack dressed like a Mortal Kombat character, had my rig stolen, and my girlfriend kidnapped. On top of that shit sandwich, I've been fighting mandroids trying not to get my fucking head knocked off. So, if you're done with your shitty pity party, I say it's time to nut up or shut up. Let's go get them guns and put some boots and some masses till we get some answers. If you don't want to do that, you can get out and try your luck. But from what I see, your luck ain't shit. Now, if you want to make it through this, you and I become we, and we go kick some asses. Between my mind being screwed up, his accent and how fast he was talking sometimes. I only caught about half of what he was saying, but he did have a point. Up until now, all I'd done was run and get caught. Meanwhile, 
He'd been taking those things out with no problem. The truth was, I had no idea what I was doing or how I'd get out of this without his help. As much as I wanted to tell this guy to fuck off and get lost, I needed him. In the end, we made a deal. He'd help me escape the city after I helped him find his girl and possibly his truck. It seemed a little lopsided, but considering that he'd just saved my ass, I agreed and we headed back to my place. The trip was silent for a while. At some point, Phil turned on the radio and the first thing we heard was this obnoxious emergency alert sound. After a few seconds, it stopped and a woman's voice announced. Attention, this is not a test. A CSL Level 4 chemical spill has been detected in the area. All residents receiving this broadcast are advised to shelter in place and await further instructions. The message was on every station except one. It was a staticky AM channel. That sounded like it was coming from someone's basement. A guy calling himself Max Truth was ranting about politics. Phil was just about to turn the radio off when Max said something that stopped him. Listen to your old pal Max Truth. The machines are out to get us. This ain't news, folks. Do your homework. This started way back in 1955. Since then, it's gone global. We're all just a step away from being obsolete. You can't compete with something that can do your job and never get tired. It never makes mistakes. It never needs days off or gets sick. Pretty soon, they're gonna realize they don't need us. And on that day, we'll see who's really in charge. Illuminati, Anunnaki, Reptilians, Watchers, or Hollow Earthers. Whatever you believe, know this. The day is coming. My advice? Stay ready. So you don't have to get ready. This is Max Truth. Stay frosty out there, folks. With that, the opening riff of Metallica's One played for a few seconds. Then, the station returned to static. Turning off the radio, Phil chuckled. (laughs) Well, ain't that something? Fucking Skynet. If my girl's name was Sarah Connor, I'd be shitting bricks. Now, all we need is a T-1000 with minigun arms, and we got ourselves a sequel going. I couldn't laugh at his joke. Every time I blinked, my eyes. I saw those blank faces staring down at me. I wondered what they did with the people they replaced. Were they dead? Or were they being kept somewhere? That thought just led to more questions. I didn't have any answers. But by the time I snapped out of my daze, we were pulling onto my street. It was probably a good thing we arrived when we did. The Sprinter van had taken a beating hitting all the goddamn robots. The radiator was cracked. The engine was smoking. 
and I'm pretty sure we were leaking gas. In any case, it didn't matter. We were a few houses away and the street was clear. As the van coasted to a stop, the silence of the city crept in. I never really noticed how loud everything was and until it wasn't there. Without the white noise of the city, I was almost hyper aware of everything around us. When we got out, the slightest sound was amplified. It was like hearing for the first time. Wind rustling through the trees and leaves being blown across concrete were almost foreign to me. It, it took a moment to adjust. By the time we reached my house, I was almost used to it. Once we were inside and the door was closed and locked, I relaxed for the first time in hours. Nodding and looking around, Phil turned to me and asked, Um, where's the toilet? When I pointed it out, he took off without another word, flopping down on the sofa and closing my eyes. I tried to blank my mind. I must have zoned out or, or drifted off somewhere because I didn't notice Phil coming back into the room. He'd gone to my kitchen, grabbed a six pack out of the fridge and was cracking one open before I realized he was there. As a matter of fact, the sound of him popping the top was what snapped me back to reality. After taking a long drink of cold beer, Phil brought the can down, belched, then gave me a nod. You all right there, Chief? Looks like you were having a moment. Want a beer? All I could do was look at him for a second. I wanted to be mad, but a drink didn't sound half bad. Long story short, we polished off the six-pack then it was time to bring out the guns. My collection isn't huge, but I wasn't about to drag it all out. I kept everything in a pair of gun safes in a spare bedroom. When I opened both safes, Phil looked like a kid in a candy store. The first thing he gravitated to was a modified Winchester 1892 with a large ring lever. I had two of them. One was a working replica of the one used by Lucas McCain in the show The Rifleman. The other was the modern take, all black with a chrome lever, but it was the short barrel version. Pointing to the replica, Phil smirked. That ain't what I think it is, is it? I nodded and smiled back and his smile got even bigger. Phew, holy shit. You got good taste. Wouldn't have begged you for a western guy. Right on. What else you got? He looked over a few more rifles and the pistols. I had a 38 revolver, a 32 pistol, two 9mm, a Norinco and a Luger, and a few 22 pistols. Then he picked up the Colt Army 357. Wiping away a fake tear, Phil turned to me. Oh, brother, please tell me you got the belt and holster for this. I nodded, and I handed him a Western-style belt and holster. I think he had a nerdgasm, smiling and doing his best Rick Grimes impression. He looked at me with a straight face and said, This is how we survive. We tell ourselves that we are the walking dead. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't help it. I laughed, shaking my head and waving, <laughs> shaking my head and waving him off. I took a seat at my workbench and relaxed. I'm tapped out. If I don't get some rest, I, 
I'm not going to be much use. We can sort this shit out in the morning. You can crash on the sofa. There's some blankets in a hall closet, man. Looking at the gun, then at me, Phil nodded his head. He put the gun in his holster and walked off into the living room. You know, it was a good idea to keep a gun handy. I already had my Norinko in my room, so there was no reason for me to grab anything. Once Phil had picked out what he wanted, I locked up and we settled in for the night. Sleep didn't come easy. I tossed and turned for a while until I finally dozed off. Somewhere around two in the morning, a, a dull thumping sound woke me up. Try not to panic. I stayed perfectly still listening to it. Using just my eyes, I looked around the room and froze when I saw a shadow on the far wall. The light from the full moon illuminated the silhouette of someone standing outside my window. All I could do was watch as the shadow slowly brought his hand up and tapped on the glass again. <sighs> I was trying to control my breathing. I felt flushed. My stomach tightened and my mouth went dry. The gun was lying next to me in bed, but I couldn't bring myself to grab it at first. Shooting bottles and targets was one thing. Shooting a person was completely different. I, I told myself these weren't people. They were fucking machines. Soulless drones filled with wires and circuits. That helped enough for me to grab the gun and slowly slip out of bed. Moving up to the window and thumbing off the safety. I eased over to the window, then took aim at the shadow. For some dumb reason, I needed to see who it was, so I switched to a one-handed grip. Then I used my free hand to pull the curtain back. As the curtain flew open, the figure outside hopped back and threw up his hands. When I saw who it was, my jaw dropped. <coughs> it was Jay. He was dirty and his clothes were torn. For a second, I, re I really thought it was him. Till I looked at his face. His movements were of a scared person. But his face was expressionless. I... God. The moment it realized I wasn't taking the bait... The act was over. The J drone stood up straight, gave me a smile, then turned and ran towards the back of the house. I already knew where he was going. My living room was a... There was a sliding glass door that lets out into the rear patio. He'd be able to crash right through it and get inside. I was out of my room and down the hall at heartbeat. When I got to the living room, Phil was standing there in his underwear, aiming the colt at the patio door. There's someone back there. The fucker just ran past the window. Scanning the darkness for any sign of the drone, I muttered, It's him, man. Him who? What's going on? It's Jay. He was the one tapping before I could finish telling him what had happened, the lights went off. There was a long, uncomfortable silence that felt like it stretched on for way too long. Then someone knocked at the front door. My heart dropped into the pit of my stomach when I heard Jay's voice. Bro, let me in. They're coming. You gotta let me in. It, w it was his voice, but, but it was all wrong. 
It was like listening to someone read out loud for the very first time. When we didn't respond, it repeated itself, but it was a little better this time. Bro, let me in. They're coming. You gotta let me in. It was almost spot on. With a little more practice, it would be impossible to tell it wasn't him. Shaking it off, I glanced over at Phil and he held a finger to his lips, shushing me. He pointed to himself, then to a spot near the front door. Next, he pointed to me, then to the door, and pantomiming, opening it. Pointing to himself again, he gripped the pistol with both hands and mimicked shooting. Nodding in agreement, I quietly made my way to the door and got in position. As soon as Phil was in place, I took a deep breath, unlocked the door, and yanked it open. There was an explosion of movement and sound as Phil pulled the trigger. The drone must have somehow known what we were planning. When the door opened, it ducked, stepped forward, then popped up and swatted Phil's arm. That caused the shot to zip past my ear, forcing to duck for cover. Phil, on the other hand, wasn't so lucky. The drone unleashed the combo from hell. It started with a stiff shot to the liver, followed by an uppercut and ending with a melee tie style knee to the balls. It happened so fast, I almost missed it before Phil could drop the dro before Phil could drop, the drone grabbed him in a bear hug and charged towards me. I couldn't take the shot without hitting Phil, so I backpedaled till I hit the wall. Dodging to the right, I managed to avoid getting squashed. Phil was having a rough night. The impact left him partially embedded in the sheetrock and completely unconscious. With him out of the way, the drone charged me again, and I hesitated. I knew the thing in front of me wasn't real, but I couldn't get past the idea of killing my best friend. That moment, that split second, was all the drone needed. It stepped in and slapped the gun out of my hand, then grabbed my wrist. Now in control of my arm, it used its free hand to chop me in the throat before sweeping my feet out from underneath me with a kick. When I hit the ground, he twisted my arm, then kicked me in the chest. Just when I thought it couldn't get any worse, the bastard put his foot in my armpit and started tugging. <sighs> the son of a bitch was trying to rip my arm off. I'm not sure when Phil came to, but I was glad he did. He snuck up behind Jay and put him in a chokehold. He released me grabbed Phil's arm and quickly bent forward, flipping Phil over and bringing him down on top of me. Oof. Oh, I let out an audible oof as Phil's weight hit me, but before either of us could blink, Jay rained down punches. He threw three quick in succession, two to Phil's face and the third that caught me squarely on the forehead. The snap of his punch bounced my skull off the floor and my vision went blurry. Phil rolled off me and I had just enough time to suck in some air before Jay grabbed me by the ankle and him by the hair as he, as he started dragging us to the front door. My vision cleared and as I saw Phil trying to grab something, following his outstretched arm, I spotted the colt just as his finger hooked the trigger guard. He grabbed it, swung his arm over, 
tossing it to me. Without thinking, I took it, aimed at the back of Jay's head, and pulled the trigger. Part of me was relieved to see sparks and smoke erupt out of his skull as his face mushroomed out. If it would have been blood and, and brain matter, I probably would have puked. Still, I sat there for a moment staring at the body. I wanted to feel bad or, or, cra or, or cry, or, but that's not what happened. I was glad I wasn't dead, glad I wasn't one of them, but most of all, I was glad it was over. I'm not sure how much more of a beating either of us could have taken. As I sat there on the floor, I, I couldn't help but wonder how in the hell that something that weighed four or five hundred pounds and was made out of steel and gears could move so goddamn fast. Huh. I, I was in rough shape, but Phil was really fucked up. A couple of his teeth had been knocked out. His face was swollen and he was covered in dust from the sheetrock. Despite that, he was back up on his feet, staggering around with a half-lit cigarette dangling from his lips. Stumbling over to the drone, he kicked it a couple of times, then dragged it out of the way and closed the door. After glaring at it for a second, he focused his attention one eye on me and took a long drag off of his cigarette. <laughs> where the fuck are these things coming from? And where did they learn to fight? That son of a bitch was kicking my ass. What was that, kung fu? Some MMA shit? Fucker hit me with a three-piece so cold I saw my soul leave my body for a second. I ain't bullshitting. I think I might have died a little. Looking at the hole he'd left in the wall, Phil paused to hit a cigarette again, then shook his head and winced. Didn't you say you found a lab? Yeah. I think we should burn it to the fucking ground. I'm tired of running from these fucking things. I want to see them all burn. I hear you, brother. But for now, let's focus on finding a ride. We ain't out running own things on foot. I smiled, got up and headed for the kitchen, motioning for him to follow me. Like a lot of homes in the area, my garage was attached to the house with access through the kitchen. Inside was my pride and joy, my pet project that had turned into an obsession. For the last two years, I had been restoring an old 1999 Silver Suburban. It was only about halfway done, but all the mechanics were done and most of the inside was done. It ran great. Plus the thing was a fucking beast. I'd planned on a cross country trip, so one of the modifications was a second fuel tank. I'd also mounted a roof rack that held two full five-gallon jerry cans of gas. Unfortunately, like I said, the interior wasn't quite finished. I'd removed the third row of seats and, and was in the process of redesigning the cargo area when all of this shit started. Opening the door, I paused for dramatic effect, then turned on the light, raising an eyebrow and Nodding his head, Phil hit a cigarette and stepped past me to look it over. Well, shit. I don't care what they say. You're all right in my book. Let's load her up and uh, get rolling. We brought the weapons we planned to carry on us. For me, it was my Norinco and a Remington I'd gotten comfortable with. Phil went with a Colt and a tactical shotgun 
Of course, we put uh, some backups in the truck, along with extra ammo and anything else we thought we might need. I handed Phil a small bag of shooter's earplugs, just in case we had to use our weapons again. While it was still early, I suggested that we take everything. I have been stocking up for the past five years on every damn thing you can think of. We loaded ten cases of water, emptied my emergency food cabinet in the basement, tools, flashlights, three sets of rechargeable long-range walkie-talkie radios, two handheld CB radios, four medium-sized first aid kits, and anything else we might need for a long trip. I really hated leaving my house, but Philip pointed out that they could overrun us with enough numbers from all sides, and then we would be really trapped. We also took all of my cans of gas that were for my generator. Once we were all set, we hit the road. While I drove, Phil screwed around with the radio till he found the only station still broadcasting. Welcome, truth seekers. You have found the truth. For those of you just joining us, your old pal Max is telling you, don't believe the hype. They're lying. There is no chemical spill, and I can prove it. I'm broadcasting live from Swan Creek right now. That's right. Tonight, we are mobile, and we will be traveling all over the city. Look us up online at maxtruth.com. We'll be streaming all night. And as usual, it's free. Because the truth shouldn't cost a thing. From there, he went into a rant about government cover-ups. So I tuned it out and focused on the road. The trip wasn't long, but I kept feeling like someone was following us. I'd catch glimpses of things moving in the darkness. Once or twice, I could have sworn I saw someone running in the street behind us. They, they, they would be illuminated by the brake lights, then disappear before I could do a double take. By the time we reached Granny's place, my nerves were shot. I was doing a pretty good job of keeping it to myself till I noticed my hands were shaking. When we pulled up in front of the house, I saw the curtains move in the window before I put the truck in park. Shit, I think she saw us. As the words left my mouth, the front door of the house opened and Granny stepped out on the porch. Smiling and waving, she said something that I could barely hear because the window was up. That was another thing I hadn't got a chance to fix yet. The driver's side window wouldn't roll down. I, I think she... I think I know what she said. Hello, boys. Come in. Welcome. For whatever reason, I nervously waved back at her, then turned my attention to Phil. Man, I'm pretty sure she's gonna fuck us up if we're not careful. The look on Phil's face went from slightly amused to the wide-eyed shock. Seeing his reaction to whatever was happening behind me, I quickly glanced back. Granny was barreling toward us, I just had enough time to shield my face with my arm before she hit. The end. God damn. The, the impact rocked the truck and shattered the window, showering us with glass. The next thing I know, the old Fembot bitch has me by the shoulders and she's pulling me out of the fucking truck. Somehow, between pulling through, being pulled through the window and hitting the ground, I managed to 
pull out my Norinko, thumbing off the safety. When the Skynet granny reached down to grab me again, I blind-fired four shots into her midsection, forcing her to back off. The separation gave me enough time to get up and face her. When I... What I saw shocked me. The holes in her torso were leaking a bright green fluid that reminded me of antifreeze. I guess the shots must have damaged something because she just stood there smiling at me. After a few seconds, she she twitched her head and said, Hello, boys. Come in. Welcome. I have milk and cookies. Her voice was glitched and distorted, as if the power source was running down. She started to repeat herself, but filler. But goddamn. But Phil cut her off with a shotgun blast to the head. Something about seeing that triggered me. I was across the yard and through the front door in no time. After a quick search of the house, I moved to the basement. By the time Phil caught up, I was in the lab looking at my fucking duplicate or doppelganger replacement. Whatever you want to fucking call this goddamn thing. Even though I'd seen it before, standing there staring at myself was fucking with my mind. The thing on the table had my clothes, my boots. My face was lying on the table. Everything that was me. It was so goddamn disturbing to see my doppelganger lying there. I was so caught up in the moment I didn't notice Phil was making his way around the room, dumping gas on everything. The fumes snapped me out of my daze. Taking one last look around, I gave Phil a nod and then headed to the next part of the lab. Moving through the hall gave me an odd feeling. I kept thinking Phil was behind me, but when I looked back, he wasn't there. Shrugging it off, I entered entered the next area and paused. This room was a lot bigger than the first, but there were no computers, just crates. They were stacked, floor to ceiling. I didn't bother checking them. Instead, I searched the room to make sure there was no one one there or no fucking drones. When I was done, I checked one of the smaller crates. I didn't know what I was expecting, but it wasn't bags of hair. There were dozens of them in every color and texture. Moving on to another crate, I found sets of teeth. Some of the bags had little, a little blood in them. They, the blood appeared to be real. If those two cases were any indication of what was in the rest of them, I wasn't not going to open any more. I believe I was looking at spare parts for new fucking androids. Dusting off my hands and I turned to walk out and heard gunshots. Before I could make it to the door, Phil came running in. Where'd she go? Confused, I looked around and shrugged. Where'd who go? I didn't see anybody. The girl. She was standing in the hall watching you. 
When I took a shot at her, she ran in the air. We both went silent and started looking around. The room was big, but if there was someone else in there, we should have been able to see them. Guns went up quickly and quietly. We checked every corner and were in the process of backing out when a crate fell from one of the taller stacks. It landed a few feet behind us and exploded into pieces. I went right, Phil went left, and we both took cover behind the first available stacks of crates. Shifting my attention up to where the crate had fallen from, I saw her. It was only a glimpse, but from what I could tell, she had curly red hair and was wearing denim overalls. As her little frame disappeared behind the crates, I saw a shape dart past the door. There was no way she could move that fast, but I knew what I saw. Waving my hand, I got Phil's attention and pointed to the doorway. When he turned to look, another crate fell close to me and the lights went out. The second the room was black, Phil went ape shit and started shooting his shotgun. The muzzle flashes from his shotgun created a strobe effect and I caught sight of the girl. There was something wrong with her. I only saw her briefly, but I could have sworn her eyes were missing. The chaos went on until Phil's shotgun clicked empty. And then he yelled. Shit! Something just hit me in the head. She's behind us. It was so dark in there, I couldn't tell which direction I was facing. If it weren't for the crate giving me something to base myself on, I would have been screwed. Putting my back to it, I fired four times before something hard bounced off my forehead and nearly made me drop my gun. <laughs> I started hearing childlike snorts and giggles <laughs> echoed around us for a second or two. <laughs> And then I heard a loud thump, and Phil shouted, Motherfucker! If my head wasn't throbbing, I probably would have laughed. Then I got hit again. The giggles turned into outright laughter, and suddenly I didn't think it was funny anymore. Whatever it was, it hit me in the side of the head. The impact knocked me off balance and I dropped flat on my ass. Oh, oh, oh my, what my, I, I fell back straight on the damn concrete, knocked the wind out of myself. The first one hurt, the second one almost knocked me out. Oh, halfway out, I sat there drooling on myself till a clicking sound snapped me back to reality. A flicker of light to my right grabbed my attention as the flame from Phil's lighter gave me something to focus on. Blinking the fog out of my brain, it took a second to process it process what he was doing. By the time I caught on, it was too late. He had been soaking a rag in gasoline, and, and it was burning and he threw it. I watched the rag, the gas-soaked rag, 
sail halfway across the room before it landed on the floor and started the gas that he had dumped everywhere to ignite. Suddenly, everything was burning. The glow of the fire spreading everywhere illuminated the room, revealing a pair of twin girls as they ran for the door. I couldn't bring myself to shoot two little things, but Phil didn't have a problem. Raising the colt, he fired off around but missed and hit the frame of the door. Fucking hell, it's the creepy twins from The Shining. Can you believe that shit? Get up. I poured gas everywhere, man. We gotta get out of here. Still a little wobbly, I stood up and happened to glance at the floor. There were shrink-wrapped skulls lying everywhere. They'd been throwing heads at us, metal fucking heads. Shaking it off, I got moving. By the time we made it back to the truck, I could see flames bursting on the first floor. We watched the house burn for a while, and we could feel the ground slightly tremble as we heard muffled explosions from underground. I grabbed one of the first aid kits and a gallon of water from the truck. Once we cleaned and bandaged our wounds, we got back in the truck. Phil told me we were headed to an industrial building on the east side of the river. That's where Phil says Debbie was kidnapped. She was asleep in the truck when it was stolen. By his logic, if we find her, we find the truck. Since I was still a little groggy, Phil was driving. As soon as he cranked the engine, he turned on the radio. And, as usual, Max Truth was the only game in town. Well, truth seekers, for the first time ever, your old pal Max is speechless. Either you're all drinking the Kool-Aid or there's something afoot, as they say. We've been driving for close to an hour, and we haven't seen a soul. If you're hearing this broadcast, do your old pal a favor. Call me here at KWTF Radio and speak the truth. We'll be glad to hear it. As the Suburban pulled away from the curb, a woman watched from the second floor of a nearby home. Once it reached the end of the block, she marked the time, then nodded picked up a radio transmitter off of the table and began her transmission. This is Surveillance Model T-800 reporting. The target human has terminated units number 125, number 265, and unit number 42. Sector 17, Lab 406 has been compromised. Catastrophic damage. Subunits 9 and 10 are active and untethered. The link unit has been neutralized. Anomaly 37 is currently headed east, armed and hostile, Category 3. Unit 501 will assist in the capture of the anomaly. Continuing surveillance. He is driven away in a 1999 Suburban. I will continue to observe target. End report.
Well, listener, that was creepy. Makes me think about my coworkers and friends. Are they what they appear to be? Hmm. How much is too much? When does technology go from being a tool of our creation to the tool of our destruction? If you like what you heard tonight, here at Dark and Disturbed Tales, Beetle Fanzine slash The Night Watcher has over 100 videos that will disturb your soul and make you want to lock your doors. Be sure and check them out. Leon Hamilton, also known as Git Yesha, Welcome to Luxaria, and Monster has been writing and drawing since childhood. It started with writing music and comics. Later, it was writing, producing, and performing music. Then after years, finally buckling down and focusing on writing. Since then, he's written titles such as The Homunculus, narrated by Dr. Creepin, The Addiction, narrated by DMT Forest of Fear, The Root of All Evil, narrated by Creepy Face, Dying to Live, narrated by Demon Creep, Bloody Muddy Water, narrated by Drew Blood for Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, File Zero, narrated by Cryptid's Roost, Bad Dog, narrated by Dark and Disturbed Tales, The Dead and Dying, narrated by The Ghost of 94, and Fuck Camping, narrated by Campfire Tales, as well as 71 various titles spread out over several different channels. When asked what his goal was, his answer was simple. Quote, I write the stories I want to read and hope to entertain a few people along the way. Unquote. If you would like to contact Leon, you can find him here on Facebook. Welcome to Luxaria and Monster Apex at gmail.com. The Ghost of 94 is an audio engineer and former podcast producer for Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Worked on the Simply Scary podcast, as well as Horror Hill and many other smaller productions. He was an editor for the Spill Your Guts podcast by Kevin Lane. The Ghost of 94 has his own YouTube channel and can be found at www.youtube.com slash at the ghost of 94 slash featured. Voice talent Duchess of the Dark has her own YouTube channel with over 400 videos to chill your spine. To quote Miss Darkness, I am the Duchess of Darkness, the one who haunts your nightmares. I've been in love with all aspects of the horror genre since I was a little girl, so I figured out a way to combine horror Ghost stories, urban legends, gothic poems, true crime and dark Hollywood stories, original horror series, and stories that are exclusive to my own YouTube channel. I always wanted to be involved in broadcasting, narrating, podcasting. I found a way to combine it with my love of horror. You can find Duchess of Darkness here, www.youtube.com slash at Duchess of Darkness 27. Creepy Face is a talented voice actor who loves telling disturbing horror stories. To quote him in his own words, I'm a multi-dimensional entity that was casted out by his parents, and the devil and I are like brothers. Hmm, sounds like my kind of storyteller. If you would like to hear more from Creepy Face, you can find him at www.youtube.com slash at creepyxface. Well, listener, it is almost time for me to go, but I have a word of advice. If you are walking down the sidewalk and see your favorite grandmother or best friend coming towards you, well, good luck to you, listener. I am your host, Steve Taylor. Thank you for joining me here at Dark and Disturbed Tales. Until next time, pleasant dreams. <laughs> <laughs>